Edwards and Happy Equinox. It's Spring Equinox and um, we're now turning the wheel towards the sunny half of the year and I can't wait because I'm very much a sun person. I'm solar powered. And um, I want to talk to you today about Spring Equinox and going in a little further to the Easter season. Now many people associate Spring Equinox with the goddess Yostra um, and we only have one reference for Yostra. Yostre Ostara. However you say that, <laughs> we have one reference for this goddess and this came from the Venerable Bede and he was a monk who uh, lived in Wearmouth in Jarrow in Newcastle upon Tyne. Northumberland, somewhere there, and um, he was writing in the 8th century and he mentioned the ancient Anglo-Saxon calendar which seemed to mention only two goddesses, I think that's right, um, and they were both deities that were associated with months around about March and April. And what he said was um, there was a goddess called Arida and she was associated with the month of March but he also said it was a, a lunar calendar and so it would um, celebrate and mark the, the new moon to the new moon. So this goddess Arida was also mentioned around about February time. So we can associate then that um, the moon that was leading up to the spring equinox was associated with this goddess called Rida. And then late, late March, early April, the goddess Yostre uh, was associated with the month. Um, he said that sacrifices were made to Rida around about March and feasts I just spat. So sacrifices were made to Rida about the time of March. We can maybe presume for a fertile crop and feasts were given to Yostre around about late March, early April. So um, this is the only reference we can find actually in literature to this goddess, which made many people actually accuse Bede of invention and saying that he made it up. Now why he would make it up would seem quite erroneous to me. Um, but it was later on um, that Jacob Grimm came along and he decided that there was too much evidence for an early proto-Germanic goddess who was a goddess of the dawn, a goddess of the sunlight, and a goddess of spring and fertility, um, and was mentioned in, well, it's mentioned in many place names in Britain, and was mentioned in the month in Germany, which is called Ostaramanoth, or Jostramanoth, something like that, my German's a little hazy, and um, he said that this was good evidence that there was such a goddess and, you know, why would Bede make this up anyway? Um, and you can find it today in our language uh, that we still call the place of the rising sun, the east. So um, we have we have the many references to an eastern sunrise dawn goddess. So it would seem that we could trace this goddess back to a proto-Indo-European goddess of spring and dawn and rising sunlight who is called something like Husus or Ausus and um, and Grimm refers to many tablets that had inscriptions to the Matrone Ostrianus so I'm saying that right? The Matrone Austria Heine. Um, and from this Grimm concludes that this goddess was quite well known, although we may have lost reference to her in later times. Um, Bede writes 
the Oster Monarch, which has a name which is now translated as Pascal Month and which was once called after a goddess of theirs named the Ostre, in whose honour feasts were celebrated in that month. Now they designate that Pascal season by her name, calling the joys of the new rite by the time-honoured name of the old observance. Her name means to shine and, and in alignment with the old ancient calendars this feast would seem to take place after the March equinox when the light again is beginning to grow in strength. Overall spring equinox is a time of balance, it is a time of equal day and night and in many ancient ways of thinking it is one of the liminal places. It is a place that is neither this nor that, it is neither winter nor summer. It is an in-between place and these in-between places and times were seen as gateways into the other worlds. So bonfires were traditionally lit at Easter and it was one of the most sacred and joyous moments was when the sun rose on Easter Sunday morning. And at this time they would bake goods um, with equal armed crosses on, which is a symbol that is older than Christianity and water that was drawn on an Easter time was also considered sacred and healing and holy. The association of this time with hares and with eggs seems to be fairly vague. It was concluded that the hare must be the symbol of or associated with this goddess of Yostre of which we know very little about. Um, but obviously both hares and birds, birds' eggs, are symbols of fertility and there's many erroneous stories out there including that the hare lays the um, birds' eggs um, but obviously the symbolism has time-honoured significance and may have become slightly muddied in the mists of time. Um, we do know there are many traditions in Slavic countries such as in Ukraine and Poland that are associated with eggs and these eggs are called pisanki and they are brightly coloured eggs which have been covered in a beeswax batik um, traditional design and then coloured and dyed at different stages to create different sacred colours. Now these eggs, unlike our Easter eggs, are not to be broken. Um, the tradition we have is that when we smash open the egg, we are breaking out into new life and into giving birth to fertility. But these eggs were never empty. They were given still whole with the yolk inside. And eventually over time the yolk would dry out. And as long as the yolk was in there, they were seen as protective symbols. So these coloured eggs, these brightly coloured eggs, were kept around the house and gifted to the family and to people in the village, to the church, to the pastor. There was a traditional amount that you would give to each person. Um, and they were seen as gifting people with protection against evil spirits, with good luck and uh, with fertility. Each egg had a sacred meaning. Each design had a sacred meaning. Each colour had a sacred meaning. Um, so this was written, taken from Wikipedia, and it says, The Hutzels, the Ukrainians who lived in the Carpathian Mountains of Western Ukraine, believe that the fate of the world rests on the Pisanke. Pisanke? I've not got a very good Slavic accent. Just take that through. As long as the egg writing custom continues, the world will exist. If for any reason this custom is abandoned, evil in the shape of a horrible serpent who is forever chained to a cliff will overrun the world. Each year the serpent sends out his minions to see how many Pisanka have been written. If the number is low, the serpent's chain are loosened and he is set free to wander the earth causing havoc and destruction. If the number of Pisanka was increasing, the chains are tightened and good triumphs, 
triumphs over evil yet again for another year. So these Pasanko, um, Pasanki in the plural, were covered in rich symbolism, including triangles, which represented the Holy Trinity, symbols such as wavy lines, which represented ploughed fields, dots represented seeds in the fields, clouds and rains were symbols, um, and the elements of air, fire and water were also included. Curls and spirals were quite often common themes and they were very protective and the spirals were said to capture an evil spirit that entered the house and keep it trapped within the spiral. Um, others were covered in goddess motifs, others still were covered in equal armed crosses, um, later they were covered in church symbols and common themes were also plants and seeds and flowers and fruits and vegetation. The serpent motif on these Pasanki was quite ancient and also very sacred um, and the serpent was the ancient god of water and earth, said to bring protection from catastrophe um, and also it had, they included animal symbols and some of these were birds, hairs, ears and wolf's teeth. So from these Pisanki we can see where our tradition of Easter eggs perhaps came from in a much earlier prehistoric time. These are still made although the symbolism used to be much more sacred, much more passed down traditionally orally in families and kept as a kind of occult um, tradition uh, and today eggs are still made but the symbolism isn't quite as um, magical as it used to be. Um, the colours of the eggs too was very symbolic. Um, so the red was the oldest symbolism and the most sacred colour and red represented the life-giving bloods. It also represented love and joy and hopes of marriage and it represented the sun and the life-giving force of the sun and the brightness of the sun. Black was a particularly sacred colour and it was associated in a good way with the other worlds. Now symbolism, eggs that were given to older people were more often black designs and eggs that were given to younger people had more red designs and so the black represented the life that had been, the wisdom that had gained and the red represented the life yet to come and the experiences yet to be painted on the egg which symbolised life. Um, yellow symbolised the moon and the stars, it also symbolised agriculture and the harvest. Blue, which is a late colour, um, which was not so easy to make with the early vegetable dyes, um, represented blue skies and good health. White signified purity, virginity, birth and light. Green signified the new life of spring, vegetation and the resurrection of nature after the winter. And brown represented the earth. And these beautiful designs that were gifted to the family were kept for years. And they would have a special place in the home to ward off evil spirits, to trap negative spirits that may enter the home and to bring blessings upon the family. And they could be passed down to generation to generation. So you can see here that the symbolism of the Easter egg was not simply a symbol for the Easter time, but for life itself and for the, the generations of life. Um, so this is perhaps where we have 
of symbolism of Easter eggs and hairs and fertility. We have many traditions in Britain that aren't quite the same as the Ukrainian Slavic Eastern Germanic traditions. Um, we have traditions of rolling eggs down hills um, and fun and games of course we have the April Fool around about the 1st of April as well. It's very much a time of the sacred fool, the um, pig's bladder of the fool is very much a symbol of fertility and um, the hares of course leap for joy in spring they were seen to be fighting at this time, mating, and their mating rituals are to box and to leap for joy and to generally be filled with exuberance of life. So it's a time of, of giving celebration, even if you do not want to do anything ritualistic. Bear in mind that even our symbolism of the Easter eggs today and of the Easter Bunny all have ancient, ancient roots and should be incorporated with knowledge of why we use them and, and what significance they have. So, as a few, a few thoughts on um, this upcoming Easter and the Spring Equinox. And of course it's a time where the sun is returning, the plants are coming out, the buds are emerging from the trees and the birds are starting to lay the eggs and we've come out of the darkness and life is returning. So I love Easter. Um, I have a theory that if Easter is not incredibly warm and hot we will have a good summer. If Easter is baking then we tend to have a rather wet and dull summer. So um, this is something I've observed personally over time. So this is my little weather law for Easter. Um, this year it's mild, it's been a long approach up to Easter and finally the cold and the storms have broken and are over. So I'm going to predict a good summer, we'll see. Alright, well thank you for listening and I hope you found that interesting. And if you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe and I hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you, bye.